Good morning, everyone, and welcome again to Work Workplace Health Insights Live. For those joining us for the first time, we've designed this series to discuss the healthcare challenges facing UK businesses, all part of our commitment to keep you updated on the latest health and wellbeing trends so you always feel one step ahead. To complement these events, we're also providing our clients and intermediaries with exclusive access to the Booper Academy for Health and Wellbeing. This week, we've launched a new on-demand module which explores how to apply behavioural insights in the workplace to boost employee engagement. More on this a bit later. So on to today's topic. Well, we may be emerging from the pandemic, but its impact on our workforce now and in the future can't be ignored. One thing the pandemic has taught us all is that keeping our workforce healthy and well is critical. On average, someone could spend a third of their life working, so the opportunity an employer has to make a positive difference during this time is absolutely huge, as is the responsibility we all have. In fact, research shows that employees now trust their own employers more than any other societal institution. Organisations can play a unique role in their employees', employees life by helping them change behaviours and be more in control of their health. Over half of the UK's mortality burden is caused by behavioural risk factors, such as smoking, poor diet, alcohol, low physical activity and environmental factors. We can only address this challenge by all working together to prioritise preventative healthcare, ensuring it's on the top of our business wellbeing agendas. And this is what our panel of Booper experts will discuss today. So what's coming up? Well, in terms of today's agenda, I'm joined by Dr. Petra Simic, Medical Director for Booper Health Clinics, who will explore why COVID has been a catalyst for preventative healthcare and what the future of optimised wellbeing looks like. We're also joined by Dr. Caroline Wood, Head of Behavioural Insights and Research at Booper Global in UK, who will define what behavioural change is and the role it can play to encourage your teams to be more in control of their health. And we're also joined by Dr. Naomi Humber, Head of Mental Wellbeing at Booper Health Clinics, who will join us for a panel discussion on how we can all take responsibility to build more resilient teams. As ever, we'll then have time for Q&A, so please make sure you send in our questions throughout the session and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. So let's get cracking. Over to you, Petra, to get us started. Thanks, Mark, and good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to be with you here today. I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes uh, talking about the future of preventative healthcare and optimised wellbeing. I'll also share a snapshot of the health of Britain's workplaces to highlight the key health challenges our nation's workforce is, is facing. The pandemic has brought the true state of the population's health into clear focus. It's escalated the urgency of addressing key public health issues such as obesity and is driving new government strategies. The pandemic has negatively impacted on many people's mental health and we believe will continue to do so with disruption to normal life as well as health and financial concerns contributing to this. As such, supporting both physical and mental health and acknowledging the link between the two will be crucial as populations emerge from the crisis. We've definitely seen a tale of two halves. NHS services describing unprecedented, unprecedented demand, and, and there is no doubt that for many people, the pandemic promoted an increased focus on their health, their personal wellness, their immune system, and how this can best be supported. Our research last summer uncovered the flip side, a worrying picture um, of up to 28% of the Brits admitting that they ignore health concerns and one in four saying they are less likely to see a doctor due to the pandemic with one in 10 choosing not to seek medical help for health concerns. So we have a population who's responded in varied ways to the pandemic um, with regards to both how and when they seek healthcare. Any successful population preventative measure will need to be able to accommodate this variation. But what about the significant impacts of the pandemic on the economy? Will this mean there's less money available for preventative or early diagnosis health initiatives at both the government and individual level? And if funding is available, what national services will be supported to the needs of this much more complex health environment? Having experienced just how important workplaces are in supporting people's health and well-being through the pandemic, and there's no doubt that was really clear to everyone, it's now more important than ever that organisations consider their ongoing role 
and how that might support, encourage and enable both preventative and early diagnosis health initiatives. People often talk about wellness, but what does it mean? I think about it as thriving rather than just surviving. Um, and it's the importance of the, the whole being. Optimised well-being can be characterised by a range of dimensions, as you can see in this diagram, spanning both our physical and emotional health, including how intellectually stimulated we are and socially satisfied we feel. Having good physical health does not ensure overall, overall well-being, just as being financially secure does not guarantee good mental health. What role does a workplace have in supporting the individual to obtain optimised well-being? Well, clearly there's occupational wellness that plays a significant part, giving an individual purpose, rewarding, rewarding work that aligns with their personal values. However, that's probably the minimum we should all be striving for. There are a number of other ways that the workplace may be able to positively influence and enable the wider environment for optimised well-being. Perhaps consider the organisations you work with. Do they have developmental programmes or a learning culture to support that intellectual wellness? Do they have a clear environmental agenda and to really help their people prioritise uh, environmental sustainability to help feel connected to the world around them? Does the health and benefits programme meaningfully support physical and mental wellness rather than just throwing a bunch of tests at people? Have they got platforms to engage, um, to enable engagement between colleagues or, or a culture which supports a, a positive work-life balance? Personally, I'm lucky. My employer contributes well beyond occupational wellness, and, and I'm a firm believer this means they get the best version of, of me. The future of preventative healthcare, early diagnosis, optimised well-being, involves continuing efforts to shift health systems away from just treating illness and towards preventing or reducing health issues in the first place. This shift needs to be looked at over the course of someone's life, not just in those key productive years and in an employee's life. A healthy teen experience will build the resilience required to become a productive adult. Supporting that team results in a downstream improvement in not just their health, that of their family and their siblings and their parents. And it's important to not just focus on supporting individuals' mental and physical health, but also on eliminating health disparities and identifying and eliminating further threats. And this may well be more infectious disease. We're very aware of the pandemic risk and this may not be over and there may be another on its way, who knows? Increased antimicrobial resistance during the pandemic, a lot more antibiotics were prescribed as remote working became much more commonplace and people became more cautious. That won't have helped our, our antimicrobial problem. And there are non-infectious hazards, such as those in the workplace, even just how we sit at our desk or how, how active we are in the workplace and the surrounding environment. There's a notable shift towards moving from reactive to proactive healthcare and moving away from the paternalistic pattern of giving someone health advice towards empowering patients, making them become informed co-creators of their own health. This means if we can get individuals engaged in their health journey, journey owning their wellness, they're much more likely to get better outcomes, both short and long term. And interestingly, we're seeing younger generations much more engaged and interested in, in health and well-being, taking preventative uh, healthcare approach, looking at self-monitoring their wellness, making much better decisions around their health and environment than perhaps generations before them. And with the health of digital tools and the Internet of Things, they may actually have way more tools than people of my generation or those before me. We're seeing this is consumer behaviour and their interaction with health and health services is changing. For example, customers are more willing than ever to tell their healthcare providers when they disagree with them, to seek out their own health information, to go prepared for their appointments, to understand what they're hoping to achieve, tracking their conditions and using data to help them make more informed decisions. And we should be really, really supporting that. We believe that in the 2020s, we'll move away from being from uh, customers and patients being the passive recipients of care. We 
see them as becoming the co-creators of their own health. And the challenge really is to equip them with the skills, knowledge and confidence they need to help themselves. And, and I think this is really important. We've seen lots of misinformation and harmful decisions that people have made about their health during the pandemic. So it's important that we empower patients to allow them greater control over their decisions and actions, but we need to make sure that those individuals are engaged and informed with appropriate levels of health literacy, knowing how to access trusted sources, what is a trusted source and what is not, and how to interpret health information that is given to them, but how it applies to them as individuals. We need to support people to be self-aware and to choose to be involved in that co-management of their health as far as they feel equipped and confident to do so. Uh, shared decision making with their healthcare providers so that decisions made are entirely uh, in alignment with that person's values. And part of that is understanding risk. And a risk can be really tricky to understand, but and everyone has their own personal risk appetite. So it's important that risk conversations are tailored to the individual and how they feel about risk. People need to have the, ca the capability uh, to alter health related behaviours uh, and, and make it meaningful to them. And I'm sure Caroline will talk more about behaviour in, in that respect. And also have agency, the capacity to act independently and to make their own choices supported and alongside a trusted health professional. The underpinning increased levels of patient engagement is the increase in digital technologies and customers' ability to easily access their health data, monitor their own health using devices and partner with healthcare providers to drive treatment decisions. Research suggests that if behaviour related risk factors were eliminated, at least 80% of all heart disease, diabetes and stroke could be prevented as could more than 40% of cancers and deaths in the US. I mean, that's pretty stunning statistics. But we know that changing behaviours, either as an individual or a population, is very challenging. Um, the, next aid, the next decade, we'll see our healthcare um, continue to embrace uh, behavioural science findings and methodologies and supporting the move beyond the one-size-fits-all reactive delivery of care. Digital health in particular is a great opportunity to apply behavioural science. Technologies that enable people to track and interpret data from wearables and smart devices, combined with the ability for clinicians to reach uh, patients through their smartphone, should allow more targeted interventions that reach people at the right time and in the right place. Behavioural science and a human-centred design um, should be part of the building blocks of healthcare delivery and drive the design of health technology, not vice versa, not be kind of afterthoughts. Uh, paired together, I think there are significant gains that can be made. Caroline is our very own behavioural scientist um, and she's, she's going to tell us more about that, so we'll hear from her shortly. A digital and data-driven approach is being adopted to support trends in both preventative health and optimised well-being. Currently, large amounts of data are continuing to be generated around the world at an extraordinary rate, with sources of data, including those um, obtained from within electronic health records, um, pathology reports, uh, and other formal health settings, as well as data generated outside of those settings. This data is described as citizen generated data, CGD, and includes online activity data, data generated from smartphones, apps, wearables, and more. The passive collection of data from personal electronic devices and the subsequent analysis is known as digital phenotyping and is thought to help measure human in impact on any intervention. What data we collect and what we do with it is important. A really good example is heart rate monitoring. Many of us will be wearing uh, smart watches. It's become very commonplace and that will measure your resting heart rate. How is that important and is it useful? Well, if you're someone who's acutely unwell or just been discharged from hospital or had surgery, then tracking your resting heart rate may be a really useful tool to indicate slow recovery or perhaps a complication may prevent you from being readmitted if it's picked up earlier. But for a well person who's not recovering from illness or not had surgery, then resting heart rate is much more likely to reflect what you've recently eaten or drunk, the stress you're under, how much you slept. And so they're not indicators of acute disease or chronic risk. 
So as with anything, the more data you get, the more overwhelming it can seem. Is it valuable data? Is it useful? Does it change outcomes? And it's more important than ever that we use the right tool to interpret this data and pull out meaningful information. And that's where things like machine learning and AI can be really invaluable tools. Digital technologies um, and supporting infrastructure, I believe will help enable health systems to strive towards environments that provide health and well-being and prevent poor health moving forward. Clinical wearables and the other Internet of Thing devices may help empower individuals to look after their health with uh, artificial intelligence and enhanced analytics, helping to support enhanced diagnostics and early intervention. Um, another great example is within the mental health field, researchers have been experimenting with AI technology to analyze voice and language patterns, screening for, that will enable us to screen for mental health issues, you know, really exciting um, technologies. So careful, targeted, consensual use of data will, uh, will support digitally enabled health improvement interventions. Um, and I think that's in a way that customers are more likely to engage with and act on moving forward. And it may also help connect customers to products and services they're more likely to need or want. So where are we now? What's the view of Britain's workplaces? At Bupu, we're privileged enough to see huge volumes of real life people and examine them and we can make diagnoses and, and get a real sense of where people's health are. We, we do this in real time. This slide shows the data drawn from just under 60,000 health assessments that we delivered in clinics in 2021. And it really shows the degree to which there is opportunity for organisations to play a unique role in their employees' lives by helping them change behaviours and be more in control of their health. So quite stunning numbers on here. You know, we look at the BMI figures, only 28% of people have a BMI in the normal range, those who attended for their health assessment uh, last year. And we know that people who um, may be more overweight or obese may actually avoid doing things like health assessments because they have a fear of being uh, told about their, their weight and what they perceive is, is lectures. It's not the way we do it in Bupa, but we certainly see that. We see 81% of people with a reduced range of movement or pain on the screen that we do for MSK activity and 65% of people being classed as inactive, which may not be a shock as we know that everyone has been tied to their desks in their home working environment. We also see that one in four people are experiencing symptoms of depression and the same number with anxiety and some will have both. One in 10 people having significant increased health risk from alcohol consumption. And we see that in the 15% of people with raised blood pressure, 32% with sleep problems and 6% at risk of diabetes. So what's the so what? So what can we do? Well, there are two interventions that would make an impact on this picture. And I would aim just at two things. Um, I've learned a lot from Caroline's team and that's that we keep things very narrow if we want to change behaviours. So alcohol and activity levels, this is where I would focus. Increasing activity, and reducing alcohol. But just knowing that we need to do this will not make a difference. We need to consider behaviour change to make these interventions impactful. So activity, changing that inactivity level is something that could be one of the most effective health improvement tools available to us. It's, you know, increasing activity reduces blood pressure, increases metabolism, reduces the risk of cancer and cardiovascular disease. And in addition, exercise produces endorphins and other hormones that contribute to good mental well-being and improve uh, in the improvement of sleep quality. Our MSK findings told us that we need to be getting people to early physio when they have aches and pains. Many cases of reduced range of movement and pain are actually a result of inactivity, poor posture, poor ergonomics. You may be surprised to know that I didn't say activity is a tool for BMI. That's because body weight and body fat changes occur more in the kitchen than they do in the gym. So activity is great for strength and stamina and other health benefits, but unless you're controlling your diet, it's unlikely to have a significant impact on BMI. So alcohol intake, harmful drinking, directly linked to raised blood pressure, poor sleep quality, raised body weight, increased risk of cardiometabolic disease, increased mental health problems, liver disease and cancer. So try to get to people to understand what constitutes healthy drinking and how to reduce alcohol related harm is important giving them tools and techniques to help them reduce their risks whilst ensuring those changes are sustainable. 
dry January may be helpful, but mainly because it helps people to recognize how they feel without alcohol and they may want to replicate that more often and they may have developed coping techniques to manage social situations without alcohol. We know that just attending a health assessment with behavioral sciences built in is a powerful tool to help change behaviors. Our new health assessments have been based on evidence-based behavioral science approaches. And as a result, it's amazing. 72% of our customers said their health and well-being improved either a lot or a little following their health assessment. And after a second coaching call, that proportion went up to 92%. So if organisations sign up to health assessments, they receive a personalised report and a snapshot, just not just of the trends, these kind of pictures, but also how they compare to themselves year on year, uh, how they compare to similar organisations within the same sector and our whole book, but also practical advice on how to make a real impact on the health and wellbeing of their people. The health of Britain's workplaces is important to us, as is the health of our people, our colleagues, our family and our friends. And we believe that alongside engaged organisations, Bupa can help us all on this journey to optimise the well-being of our people. Um, that's all for me, Mark. I'll be around for questions later. Um, so back to you. Thank you, Petra. Um, a uh, great start there. A big, big shift you did for us there in, in bringing that to life. I, I think um, you made a comment at the beginning there about lots of people not wanting to go for their health assessments because they know what you're probably going to tell them. Uh, I'm a bit worried actually after that slide that you have the state of the UK workforce that people won't want to turn up to these these sessions anymore as I was looking and recognizing myself in in a number of those and, and, and thinking long and hard about changes I need to make. I, I think one takeaway for me and what you said is that um, if organizations want to be a really attractive employer going forward the days of just providing PMI and thinking you've done the job are, are, are over. Um, people are expecting way, way more from us as employers now in terms of the deal um, that, that we give. And, and um, there's obviously loads of uh, tips there that you started to give us. Um, before we, we go on to the next session, I just want to flag we're going to set, um, as ever, a poll live. So the question is, do you think your organisation pr promotes preventative healthcare enough? Yes or no? Simple answer. Uh, so we'll have a look at that in a second, but so that we can start getting to grips with the things that we can all do to make some of those interventions, I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Caroline Wood, who's going to talk about how we can apply behavioural insights in the workplace. So over to you, Caroline. Thanks, Mark, and good morning to everyone. Um, I head up the UK Behavioural Insights team here at Briefer, and we work across our UK business, bringing that behavioural perspective to a whole range of business challenges. We also support our clients and naturally their employees too to make the most of the products and services they have with us and to maximise that all important health and well-being of their workforce. So as Petra mentioned in our most recent Bupa Health Trends report, there are some startling stats, really startling, demonstrating that a high percentage of people ignore health concerns and avoid that seeking help uh, despite having symptoms. And this really highlights why supporting people to engage more in their own well-being and helping them to see it as a priority piece should be right at the top of employees' to-do lists. And interestingly, it's, it's not just because people's interest in their own health isn't there. Our data also showed that more people are proactively searching for information about monitoring and tracking multiple aspects of their health, including stress and fitness, alcohol intake and mood. So the real question becomes, if we know we should change our behaviour and lead a healthier lifestyle, why don't we? Now, the answer partly lies in understanding human psychology and insights from decades of research about how we interact with and respond to information around us, our environments and also our own internal thought processes and emotions as well. Now, at the heart of the wellbeing challenge is the fact that they're largely irrational thinkers. So 90 to about 95% of our everyday behavior is unconscious and it's driven by habits and mental shortcuts. Yet there are predictable patterns in this irrationality if we draw on the science. Now, behavioral insights as a specialism, it's really blossomed over the last 15 years or so. And its purpose is focused on drawing on the science of how people think and how we behave to solve behavioral challenges. So if we take a broad challenge like motivating people to improve their health and well-being, temptation is absolutely there to jump right into that solution mode, do the exciting creative bit of putting new things, new products in front of people, maybe new tech, the latest things out there on the market, and just seeing how they respond. 
Now, jumping straight in, you might strike it lucky. You might boost some interest amongst your workforce, motivate a percentage of the group for a while. But taking the time to unpick that question mark you've got on your screen now and drawing on that science to really understand what's going on. So why people aren't already motivated, what's stopping them from getting engaged in the first place will ultimately save you time, it will save you resources and improve your chances of achieving that longer lasting behavior change that we're all after. And that's at the, the nuts and bolts of the behavioral approach, drawing on several different sciences under that same umbrella, the psychology, sociology, anthropology, neuroscience and economics to really understand behavior before trying to change it. And of course, it's, it's nice to understand why people do what they do, but it's also hugely beneficial to help solutions land in the way that they're intended. And because we're drawing on those decades of scientific research, it ensures that we're designing solutions with how employees naturally think and act, rather than trying to shoehorn them into new ways of thinking. So referring to what's been studied before in similar contexts is also useful because it reduces the uncertainty about whether a solution will work or not. It reduces the amount of time too that it takes to design, as well as things like cost and resources needed for that design process. It also means that we can be more responsive and move in an agile way. If you've got that science underpinning what you've done, it makes it much easier to go back and see what needs to change if something doesn't quite go to plan. You've got a bit more of a roadmap. And then finally, it's still quite rare as a differentiator for companies to have access to dedicated behavioral insights resource, such as my team, to sit in that driving seat and to guide that challenge solving in this way. And there's a growing number of industries that have seen the impacts that behavioral insights can bring, which is great. And it now forms a core part of how they approach challenges. And there's a handful of these that I've got for you now on your screen. So for example, sending reminder text messages out to patients, alerting them how, to, uh, how much it would cost the NHS if they missed their upcoming hospital appointment. Now, just simple changes to the framing of that text message informed by how we as humans psychologically process information resulted in a whopping 6,000 fewer missed appointments over the year and saved the NHS more than 928,000 per year as well. Also designing a well-known app-based taxi company's express call service that matches single riders with others traveling to the same area using behavioral concepts. Saw this particular company benefit from an 11% reduction in riders canceling their bookings. And then finally, an innovative insurance company who embed behavioral theory deep through their operating model, a rapidly changing public perceptions of insurance and the claims process. And as a result, have impressive stats around not only the number of quotes they convert to premium purchases, but also hold the record for the fastest approved customer claim journey as well. And there are several different ways in which we work with clients to bring this behavioral science approach to life. Now, every change, challenge is different. So for some clients, we'll work in all of these ways you see on the screen, and for others, maybe just one or two. So for almost all client challenges, we'll start with a define and discover phase where we scope out, we understand the context around the challenge, we look at the relevant scientific research and get a feel for any barriers to change that might exist. Taking these insights, we draw on behavior change frameworks and techniques to co-create and to put in place and evaluate solutions, iterating as we need to achieve the best result for all. In recognition of the fact that some clients will have solutions already in place that perhaps aren't working or landing as well as they should, so maybe that's comms such as email, web pages or portals or even existing wellbeing strategies, we can help review and provide that guidance through that behavioural lens on how these might be optimised. And then finally, we deliver virtual and in-person health talks as well, bringing a behavioural perspective to a range of health and wellbeing topics. And we've had the pleasure of supporting several clients now to help tackle a whole range of business challenges. And I've got a couple over the next few slides to help give you a flavour of how these worked in action and the outcomes we were able to achieve. Now, when we started speaking with the team at Virgin Media, they were keen to do something for their staff to support them to improve their well-being and to help them narrow down exactly where to focus. We ran what we call a behavioural diagnosis workshop with them. And this was essentially a chance for the key stakeholders in the business to put ideas on the table, an opportunity to discuss where the biggest impact could be made and then hone down which behaviours to target. 
a big percentage of their workforce were male engineers. They were based off site, um, who spent the majority of their time traveling on the roads uh, to different locations. So the solution we landed on was to place stickers highlighting our Healthy Minds EAP service into engineers' vans. And this really helped to break down barriers such as poor awareness of the service, but also served as an effective prompt for staff to call in an environment, i.e. their van, where they were likely to be alone, unlikely to be disturbed. Now, both of these insights we knew from the research to be factors that could prevent uptake. And what we found was awareness of the service increased and a greater percentage of the workforce intended to use the service if they felt they needed it. In this next example, we were asked to support a different client with the challenge of improving their employees' well-being in contact centres. So to give you a bit more of a context, morale was low, sickness levels had risen, and they'd seen a decline in engagement as well. So we delved into the research around workplace well-being, we looked at staff surveys, we spoke to some of the staff themselves to get their perspectives, and also visited the contact centre offices to get a feel for that environment and the context. And based on these insights, we put together a well-being framework of seven different principles of workplace well-being. We worked with the client to design bespoke solutions to target each principle. The results from this simple yet different way of thinking about things were pretty good as well. So team satisfaction improved, turnover reduced, we saw staff absence reduced by 50%, and customer NPS scores climbed to 71. In this final example, another client was keen to get support with looking at how their people were already engaging with internal comms about their wellbeing program in the hope that they could boost that interaction. As a first step, we worked closely with them to identify patterns in engagement and spot where key opportunities for boosting engagement were likely to be. And attending wellbeing webinars was decided on as a focus, and so we carried out an audit of their upcoming comms for a mindfulness campaign. And we made recommendations on behaviour change techniques that could be built in to increase that engagement. The recommended enhancements not only increased people's awareness of the event versus others run previously, but they also drove sign-ups for the upcoming event as well. Now, nine times out of ten, when my team gets asked to advise on a challenge involving the words increasing engagement with X or with Y or help understanding engagement with uh, products or service, the first follow-up question is, can you be more specific? And this really isn't because we're being pedantic, it's because engagement is what we call a behavioural outcome. It's a point that you reach because of other behaviours happening first, rather than a behaviour in itself. So think about losing weight. That's an outcome, an outcome that could be achieved if a person were to do several different behaviours, such as eating less and moving more. And research tells us that there are two parts to engagement. There's the behavioural part, that is the extent to which something is being done, so whether staff are clicking the link to sign up to a webinar that they've been invited to. And there's the experiential part, how they feel about the webinar, how interested they are in the topic and so on. And there's at least four factors that make a good engagement more or less likely. So how it appears to your employees, it's form, how you present it to them, it's format, their environment, so where they are and who they're with when they learn about it from you, and their individual characteristics, so things like their motivation to engage in their attitudes. The main point is the reasons getting good engagement can be tricky because there's these multiple factors at play. So the employee who's engaged with their well-being may be opening emails from the, their well-being team regularly, they may be going along to events and using services, and they may already have healthy habits built into their routine too. On the flip side, an employee who's disengaged may struggle to stay motivated to all of the above and not engage with what you're sending them. The interesting thing about employee engagement is that it's likely to build up in stages, meaning that employees are very, very rarely completely disengaged if they're at least aware of what you're offering them. Instead, it's a case of finding a way that nudges them along to the next stage. So if you start with awareness where your employee first learns of what you're making available to them, if it resonates with them, they move on to considering whether to take any action. And this is where a large percentage might get stuck as that jump to step four, so trying something out for the first time, can feel huge, potentially if there's a lot of barriers in the way as well. 
Once that first use is over and done with, our employee moves on to ongoing engagement in stage five. And this is a bit like a holy grail stage, as we've reached a point where our employee will hopefully stay for a fair while if they're interested in if we continue to meet their needs. Even after an employee stops engaging, it might be that there's something similar or new that will better fit their needs and we can position to them to re-enter this process. Now, just because we're humans who don't always act in our own best interests or follow through with the best laid intentions, you will always see various patterns in engagement amongst your workforce. So some will engage once and never return. You'll get some who get involved for a period of time and then tail off. You'll even get some who dip in and out, random ways without rhyme or reason. But the real aim is keeping employees consistently engaged so well-being stays top of their agenda and they can feel really, truly supported to live longer, happier and healthier lives. Now, thinking through a behavioural lens is key to effectively engaging your employees in workplace health and wellbeing. And today we're delighted to announce the launch of a brand new on-demand module as part of our Booper Academy programme. And during this short module, we'll introduce you to a three-step process, which you can use to A, help you spot opportunities to improve that engagement using information you're already probably likely to have to hand, uh, B, identify existing barriers which maybe prevent your employees from engaging as you anticipated, and then also how to design solutions directly addressing these barriers to ensure that they really match your company's unique culture, but also the context as well. Thanks very much for listening, and if you'd like any further information about working with the Hooper's Behavioural Insights team, please contact your Booper account manager. Back to you, Mark. Thank you, uh, Carolyn, another great session. And um, yet again, I think further evidence that uh, there's a lot to this. You need to be very thoughtful about the interventions you make. Um, and also, you know, some of the things that you could do that you think solve the problem, you know, maybe they're not enough or, or they could actually have unintended consequences. So I think very enlightening again. Interestingly, we've got the results here from the poll. Um, and uh, as ever, you always hope when you do these polls, you get the answer you're looking for. 70% of you uh, believe that organisations are not doing enough to, to promote preventative health care. So uh, clearly there's a big opportunity here um, for us all to make a difference in, in terms of how our employees um, feel about their health and well-being and, and some of the results that we can get from that. So let's, um, without further ado, move on to our panel discussion. So I'd, I'd love to welcome Naomi, Dr. Naomi Humber, to the conversation. Naomi heads, heads up our mental wellbeing agenda here at Booker. So hi, Naomi, and welcome back uh, to uh, Petra and Caroline. So we're, we're all here. Naomi, you're probably expecting this as you haven't spoken yet, but I'm going to come to you um, with, for my first question. So we've talked in general about health all, all the way through the, the, the presentations. Uh, but I'm really keen to understand your perspective really on what employers can do to really zone in on, on creating that really strong, mentally resilient workforce. Yeah, thanks, Mark. It's a great question. Hi, everyone. Um, I think from my perspective, resilience is seen as the ability to bounce back from setbacks and challenges in life. And in the corporate world, we see this as a necessity as it's there on a daily basis, really. And so we don't just want our workforce to survive. Uh, you know, setbacks, challenges, unpredictable times, changing times, unsettling times as they've been with the pandemic and so on. Live in the face of things. So to achieve this, I suppose we have things that we need to do really from a from a systematic perspective and a, we have to be quite methodological in it really, the approach that we're going to take um, to achieve what we set out to do. So I think the first thing, the important step for me is identifying the climate of the workforce in regards to the resilience and the well-being of the, the people within the organisation. So I think that the first um, exercise a, a company could do is to compare by doing a benchmarking exercise. So looking at where they are within, you know, the, the country maybe at large, you know, how they, how they compare on, on various measures maybe within the industry within which they're in as well, that might be a helpful way, uh, place to start. Then thinking about engaging with self-assessment tools. So looking at things such as, you know, um, the risk side of things and also how to mitigate the risk that they find within that, that exercise. And also then having a true sense really of, of what is happening and also the, therefore then where to focus, I suppose, which is the name of the game. 
I think the next thing to think about is understanding and listening to the voices of the employees. Everyone has different life experiences, different industries have different socio demographics, different socio economic challenges that they can face uh, within, uh, for example, the, the locality within which the organization is based. So developing corresponding relevant, appropriate, responsive initiatives to the employee needs and voices are so crucial really. So have a strategic implementation, which is fit for purpose, which is the most important thing and the, the employees needs are met. And I think finally, the implementation of the vision and the strategy is, is very important. And once we've got that data and that insight, we're then able to have strategic goals. We are able to have a vision specific to the organization. And then we continuously iterate and evolve over time to make sure that it's appropriate for that uh, particular workforce. And if I can just finally mention very quickly, some things are free and, and, and easy to apply, but sometimes forgotten, I suppose, from, from an employer perspective. And these are things such as um, key mental health related messages um, are sometimes delivered in a, in a sort of a robotic form and they might, um, you know, land, you know, in the wrong way, for example. So we really need to ensure that the, the, the messages are genuine, are meaningful, come from the heart really, um, because mental health can be quite an emotive subject. And I think speaking uh, to that as well, having senior ambassadors within a business who may have had experiences of mental health issues themselves, modeling openness to the subject, encouraging proactive mental health care and accessing mental health care is particularly helpful to, um, you know, disengage the barriers really to, to accessing help. Uh, and then finally, I suppose, if I can just say, um, leading with compassion rather than criticism and having a, an ethos of cohesion and uh, connectivity would be really, really helpful. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Naomi. And just, just going to stay with you for a second. So I guess the whole tone of today has been about what we as employers can do for our employees. But obviously, um, anywhere I've worked, we've always also tried to encourage employees to take some responsibility themselves, whether that be for their own performance, their own development. Um, what about um, any nuggets that you've got about what employees can do to, to look after their own mental health and, 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 and make themselves more resilient? Yeah, it's another great question. I think, um, you know, in business, it's all about performance. And I think from an individual level, it's about performing at your best at all times if possible. So on an individual level, I think ideally we should see ourselves as performing like a business athlete. And if you think about the, the environment within which we practice and train, we are running a marathon, not a sprint. And we're playing the long game, really. So it's about sustaining ourselves from a mental health perspective, from a well-being perspective, and maintaining a peak level of fitness in some way and wellness. So thinking about a business athlete and what they would focus on, um, it would be about practicing effective strategies for things such as communication excellence, whether that be verbally or in written form, thinking about relationship management and how we go about you know, managing different relationships within our work thinking about our mental strength and agility and adjusting to things that might be going on and personal effectiveness on lots of different levels, really, to achieve the optimum results within our particular field, which is business. And then specifically, if I can just mention about, you know, having a good awareness of ourselves and understanding of ourselves as a person is useful, particularly our personality type, how we work with others, what are other people's personality types and how we can get the best out of them. A big focus is cognition, so how we manage our perspectives, how we look at the world, uh, maybe keeping our attitudes at times in check or our unhelpful thoughts at times, thinking about physiology. So do we get up and get out of bed thinking, I feel very refreshed and energized, or do we need to look at our personal energy in some way in our physiology? And things, things like self-regulation, you know, emotions in check and things like that. And just to allow us really to perform at our best and stay resilient and prevent mental health issues, I suppose, as much as possible. Right. Okay. Plenty for us all to think about um, there, I, I think. So I'm going to come to Petra now. Welcome back, Petra. Um, you talked um, earlier about MSK 
uh, and issues around MSK. And I think you showed a stat that said 81% of people uh, in our health assessment data have some kind of reduced range um, when it comes to MSK issues. Yeah, as we're all getting used to this hybrid way of working and I'm feeling myself sat here now, kind of hunched over, probably not with the proper yeah. posture and, and so on. Yeah, how, how, how can we help organisations proactively manage their role in some of these MSK challenges that we've got? I mean, such an important question. And, um, you know, as we, you know, it, I think we need to recognise now that for most organisations, hybrid working is, uh, is here to stay. And as a result, the focus that we uh, placed previously on workplace health, and that was often related to things like the ergonomics and the desks and the environment that people were working in, we now need to shift that focus with the same clarity around people's home working environments. Um, if you are, uh, if you have a population that are hybrid working, and really encouraging um, people to address that, because working at home, a you may, may not be working in a very uh, ergonomically uh, ideal situation. So people working on laptops, on sofas, on kitchen tables, um, but also a commute for many people is a form of activity so even if you are someone that drives you're still walking to your car driving your car parking your car walking from your car which is very different from just setting opening the laptop on the kitchen table and for anyone that uses public transport i know that my step count when the pandemic came just halved overnight so i was no longer walking to the station and, and walking to the office walking around the office and so i think there's some really practical things that people should be doing for their hybrid working population that is making sure that people have got appropriate setups at home whether that be more than one screen whether it be risers whether it be appropriate chairs desks i personally bought an ikea standing desk over christmas at the, the the suggestion of my husband and it's been amazing to have a standing desk and um you know things like that i wouldn't have thought of a year and a half ago as being really important but really important for me and and also encouraging people to get off their bottom during the day because if they're working from home and i'm sure mark you'll know this you can sit in the same place for eight or nine hours um, and, you know, sitting is the new smoking. There is no doubt that sitting is one of the worst things we can be doing for our health. And it doesn't matter how much exercise we do when we stop sitting. We can't undo the sitting. So encouraging people to take breaks when they're working from home, because I think people feel compelled to be attached to their laptop to justify them working from home and um, to do walking meetings. Um, and actually to set an example, if you are a leader of a team, to tell your team that you went out for a walk during the working day. And in fact, I know some people that actually do a walk in the morning as if they were commuting to the station to kind of just bring that habit back in. Because as Caroline talked about, these, these need to be habits. These need to be things we don't have to add to the mental load of our day. So I think it's demonstrating. So if you've got a team making sure they have the right setup, telling them they must have the right setup, it's important. Um, and then, of course, getting them to recognise when their bodies are not working well and to seek appropriate professional input early. But yeah, home working is not all it's cracked up to be for the physical self. I think you've just given me an idea for our marketing team, the UK campaign called Off Your Bottom. Uh, <laughs> I love to get it. the whole of the UK working. Uh, watch out the Booper marketing team. <laughs> that, that, that one's coming in your direction. Uh, thank you, um, Petra. I'm going to just go to Caroline now. So. Caroline, we've all um, been there, and I suspect some of us will be this afternoon after listening to this, where we decide to take some action and we lay down a plan about what we're going to do and we're really excited about it, and then it fizzles out and, uh, and, and in the end we don't see it through. You know, what, why is that? What, what's going on there? Yeah, it's really annoying, isn't it? But just some thinking that something is a good idea to do and then meaning to do it has very little relationship with whether we actually do it, which is a real pain. And this gap between our intentions and our behaviour is called the intention action gap. There's an actual name for it. And it's really widely doc documented um, across many different health behaviours, including smoking, physical activity and diet as well. And um, this gap can be a result of a lot of different factors. So the environment around us, uh, mental, social, physical, situational influences all play their own role in our behaviours. So it can get us going directly into that gap, even when our intentions are really strong. 
And when we put off something until tomorrow, because we can't be bothered to do it today, it feels like someone else is going to have to do it for us. Um, and that feels great. So you keep on going in that loop, you keep procrastinating, putting things off. And it's a phenomenon that we call present bias. And it's the tendency to focus on the here and now over um, overvalue immediate rewards at the expense of longer term benefits, which what that actually means is that people do not necessarily make their long term health a priority in the way that they should do. Instead, they want to focus on the more immediate needs and goals like relieving stress by eating comfort food. It can make it really feel very difficult to put those good intentions into action. So one thing you can try just a top tip is um, if then planning, and this is a technique that can help you think about things that you could take you off track and make plans for how you will handle them ahead of time. Because as humans, we don't like feeling about or thinking about what could go wrong. We don't like that planning piece. It makes us very uncomfortable. So if then plans can help set you up for success because they help cue your brain to focus on goals and how you're going to get yourself there. Um, one example could be if you miss your morning work walk before work, then you'll go for a 30 minute walk at lunchtime instead. It just helps you set you up for the, to avoid you falling into that gap. Brilliant, Th thank you. Um, I've got a question that, that I'd be interested actually in all, all three of yours perspective on it. I, I noticed this as part of being involved with BITC over the last few years, that a lot of this narrative is, is great and easy to understand when you've got big HR departments, big budgets for this kind of stuff, but a massive part of the UK uh, working population, working small businesses, where maybe the, uh, you know, the owner of the business is struggling to stay afloat themselves, and they just haven't got the brain space to be thinking about setting up preventative um, programs and, and all of these things that we're saying employers should do. Have you got any thoughts from a, for, for some, maybe some of our smaller businesses about things that they can do or be th even just thinking about or where they could start on, on limited budgets or with limited time? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if any of you uh, have, a, have any view on that. Maybe, um, maybe Naomi, just, just to start with you. I think it's a bit like um, what I've been mentioning about the sort of the leadership um, side of things really and, and making sure that they live and breathe what they're looking for their employers to do as well. Now, obviously the, the leader's in a very difficult position there by the sounds of things at times and we have to get to a point where we can model almost what we expect and actually demonstrate how much it means to us, the leader, that they do that. and talking back to the, the comments about sort of connectivity and cohesion and having a shared sort of culture really and ethos to the business, those things can really come for free in some ways. And it is about the inter, interpersonal um, relationships that the leader has with people, how they look after each other, how they value each other, how they behave towards each other. And I think that those things are, are very much forgotten at times, but they are so, so vital to health and well-being in the workplace. Yeah, great. And, and Petra, just on this topic about maybe smaller businesses, when you think about the things that we look at and the important things to benchmark, if I'm a small business owner, is there, are there any specific things you would encourage people as a priority, a business owner, mm. to be trying to make sure that they're, they're kind of putting at the top of their list if they're going to start somewhere with this agenda? Yeah, I mean, it, there's so many things you could benchmark. I mean, certainly when, when I look at data out of organisations, the key things I look at to get a sense of the overall wellness and well-being is things like mental health. So if you've got a health assessment programme, making sure that you can pull out MI that looks at the mental health outcomes and, and diagnosis within your teams. But if you don't, then looking at kind of absence data and, and, and really trying to track what's happening in that space. Uh, because often mental health issues, although they may not originate in the workplace, will be exacerbated by a workplace that isn't taking people's mental well-being um, seriously or not putting up the agenda. I think um, alcohol and activity are two other areas that I think can, you can really start to see trends in businesses because businesses ultimately are little ecosystems of their own and, and cultures. So, you know, trying to get people moving more, trying to get them drinking less or less reliant on alcohol as a stress reliever or a celebratory thing. Those are things that are 
really useful tools to kind of track and they're the kind of things I look at when I first look at company health reports to get a sense of where that company is compared to its sector and compared to Outlook and then compared to, to itself and you know and I'm going to always say this but yeah, health assessment programs are a really great way to empower your people but they do need encouragement people need to be encouraged to go I, I met with our Bupa CMO um, informally the other week and she told me that her health assessment of Bupa this year was the best one she's ever had and she's had many and she told me how she used to dread going. She also said I could share this. She would dread going for her health assessments because she didn't want to get the lecture and what she experienced was a completely new experience of not about feeling lectured but about feeling empowered. So if you do have an SME that's actually put all their eggs and, and invested in a health assessment program, encouraging them to encourage their staff to use it because the outcomes are really good and it's not about lecturing, it's about empowering people. So, you know, that, that's my thoughts. Yeah, brilliant. No, thank you. And really pragmatic help there. <laughs> I remember, again, as part of the ITC, talking to a construction firm where they're just, in, I mean, it's a big firm, but they're just in the simple thing of talking to their employees about what they thought would help them. And they moved to uh, longer working days, uh, Monday to Thursday for people who were working away from home, because the insight they had by talking to their employees was that the, the guys on the, on the construction site knew they would end up in the pub every night if they were working shorter days, whereas actually longer days and having an earlier thing on Friday meant they got home earlier to see their families. And, and everyone was a, was a winner, happier, healthier, employees and that was just born out of the fact of having a conversation saying what could I do to make this work for you and uh, you know that's free. Yeah, yeah ab absolutely and being really kind of open to, to, to ideas and thinking about the added benefits you know absolutely how great they get to go home to, to, to their families earlier but they're drinking less and that is going to be invaluable for everyone so I think a brilliant yeah. example Mark. No thank you. Um, great. I think we're, we're just about out of time. And as ever, you know, with 20 minutes to go, I was looking at some questions we might have and thinking we're never going to fill 20 minutes. And, and now I've got a queue of questions wrapped up that we've run out of time for. So we will try and make sure we get those um, answered uh, offline as ever. We've got questions coming in about hybrid working and equity and fairness between who's expected to be in the office and not in the office. And how do you manage that to the business case for screening programs and, and how do you make that? And, where do you start with putting that case to your to your board for if you want to try and um, get some progress there? So there's there's loads of great stuff that's come out today. Thank you so much to all of our panelists and, and speakers as, as ever. Really, really insightful. Um, I'm always thinking, yeah, what do I take out of, out of this? There's a consistent theme I think in pretty much every session we do, which is there's always something you can start from in terms of you as a leader and the way you show up and the way you role model. And we've heard it again today, even with no bu budget, just choosing to do some things differently yourself and, and making sure people can see you doing that, like the walk in the middle of the afternoon, if you've got the liberty to do that and people then taking your lead. So lots to, for us to think about individually. But I think most of all for organisations today, what I've heard is um, it's really important that businesses have an intent to do something here because people are expecting it. Um, I think it's important that it's not only about what you choose to do, but how you choose to implement it and just taking that extra time to be thoughtful wherever possible, seek some, seek some expertise to make sure that you're not going to get unintended consequences for your good intentions. And, and then probably taking the time to reflect and measure whether or not your interventions are, are having any difference. So I think if we can all just make small steps and, and take a bit more responsibility in terms of our role, in supporting the uh, the health and, and well-being of the UK uh, population, then uh, you know the, the world will gradually be becoming a, a much better place. So thank you for joining us uh, again today. Uh, as ever, we've got lots of uh, programmes to come. I think there was a poll that we did halfway through, seeking your input about things that you might like to see um, in the future from us. Uh, and uh, we'll speak to you again really soon. Thanks for joining.